So my name is Michael Bensink. I'm the Director of Student Wellness here at Bristol. And I'm also one of the members of the consortium Communities Talk, Bristol Talks, that is bringing this program to you today. I'm honored to introduce to you Dr. Laura Douglas, President of Bristol Community College. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome. I am Laura Douglas, president of Bristol Community College, and I would like to say that the behavioral health of our entire student body is of utmost importance to me. There's such a range of, of uh, substance abuse, misuse, and mental health issues that today's young adults and college students face. It's very different from the times that maybe I was in college. This presentation, I think, is very timely because um, last week, on February 13th, the Massachusetts Senate unanimously passed Bill 2519. Are you familiar with that action? took place last week? Well, I'll tell you about it. It's an act to address barriers to care for mental health, to increase access to mental health services by removing barriers to timely quality care and providing the state with more effective tools to enforce existing mental health parity law. Aren't we fortunate to learn and live in a state where our government is committed to help serving our behavioral health needs here in, um, here in Bristol County as well. So I'm very thrilled to welcome you to Corey's Cause today, uh, entitled My Journey from Athletics to Addiction. And I want to say that we so very much appreciate the Women's Center here at Bristol Community College, our wonderful counseling services led by Michael Bensink, uh, Star Prevention, and also SAMHSA, the Sub Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and all of you who are attending for supporting such an important event. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Douglas. I'm happy now to introduce to you one of the key members of the Communities Talk Bristol Talks Consortium, Sheila Kaufman. She's a Prevention Services Coordinator at Stanley Street Treatment and Resources, Star Prevention. Please welcome Sheila. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, the very first thing I want to say is Whenever we do events like this, we never know who's going to come or if anyone's going to come. But we always know it's difficult to get um, young people involved in the work that we do. So I am really, really thrilled that all the peer leaders, peer educators are here. And I think we should all give you a huge round of applause for being here. And I, I mean that sincerely. Like you. Um, you're taking time out of your, I know, school vacation, and I really appreciate you being here. Um, I have a number of talking points, so I'm just going to go through them if you don't mind, because I think there are things that we all need to think about. So, um, you know, again, I want to welcome you to the first um, Communities Talk Bristol Talks. Um, and this initiative did c come about when we all sort of got together from, um, you know, STAR and um, Bristol Community College after receiving a small stipend from um, SAMHSA. Um, the co committee consisted of members from the community, including us, the STAR um, prevention team, and others from STAR, um, the city of Fall River, as well as several departments from Bristol Community College, including student wellness, um, the health services and mental health counseling, and the Women's Center. Um, because of the high rate of opioid-related overdoses in Fall River, we thought it was important to bring attention and awareness to how easily it can happen and some of the things that you, we all can do to help prevent more young people from overdosing on alcohol, opioids, and other substances. We did um, talk about a number of different presenters we could bring in, and everyone thought that the presenter we have for you today was um, the best fit. Um, I want to remind you all here that it's important to talk to um, your friends, children, other children, grandchildren, brothers, sisters, colleagues, um, about the dangers of using alcohol and other substances, particularly why, while the brains, our brains are still developing. Um, so 
it's, it's um, been well documented now that the brain continues to develop until um, about the age of 25. We want to encourage you all to get um, rid of and tell people um, in your families and others um, to get rid of unwanted medications. Um, lock up what you have at home, and this includes alcohol. Um, talk to elderly friends and relatives about the dangers of leaving medications at home that are, that are no longer necessary or expired. Um, it's really important that we all get educated about addiction. Um, we, we know that a lot of people are suffering, and um, it's important for us to get as much information as we can. Please visit the resource tables um, when you leave um, the room. We need to keep talking and listening to our children. Um, it's also important that, um, especially since the young people are here, that, you know, so the statistic says that 40% of those who begin using alcohol or another drug before age 15 will develop a problem with alcohol or another drug at some point in their life. If we can get young people to wait until they are 24 or 25, we, they can greatly reduce their chances of having problems with alcohol or another substance. And as Dr. Ro Ruth Pote, family physician and addiction medicine physician says, delay, 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 or avoid altogether. We need to keep talking to and listening to our children. I don't want to go on and on. There's so much we can talk about as far as you know, stigma and mental health and addiction, but you're all here to listen to the presentation. So I encourage you all to grab information today, um, ask for more help or information if you need it, and I want to welcome and thank uh, Lori and Dave Gonzalez for being here today. If we could give them a welcome. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us and thank you Sheila and Bristol Talks for inviting us. Um, we're here today to share our family's journey with addiction. Um, you'll meet our son Corey a little bit later, um, but if you leave here with any bit of knowledge today, please, I hope you leave with the fact that addiction does not discriminate, it knows no boundaries and it can happen to absolutely anyone. It's really important to us that we remove the stigma and we make everyone understand that it truly is a disease that can happen to anyone. Um, on July 15th, 2013, I was in my home and my phone rang and I got the phone call that most parents dread. There was a voice on the other end of the phone. He had picked up the phone and looked for mom on Corey's cell phone, dialed me and told me that Corey was being put in an ambulance because he had overdosed. Um, I, my husband and I got in the vehicle and drove to Falmouth because that's where he was. We didn't really understand at that point from that phone call the severity of the overdose. I had just thought that they would give him Narcan, which is a overdose reversal drug, and that I would pick him up and that I would bring him to treatment and we would kind of start the whole cycle all over again with him. Um, on our way to the Cape, we live in Taunton on 495, my phone rang and it was the hospital telling me that actually he had died on the table, but they had revived him. They revived him, but they had to put him on life support. So the only thing that was keeping him alive was a tube down his throat that was breathing for him. It was a very difficult ride, as you can imagine, and right before we got to the Bourne Bridge, my cell phone rang again, and it was the hospital chaplain, and she said to me, um, you know, the situation is very dire. It's a bad, it's bad. We don't think that he's gonna make the night. And would you like clergy and what religion are you? So when she said those words to me, I was like, you know, why? Because I couldn't even wrap it around my head that my son could die that night. Um, but I told her, you know, we would get there as soon as we could. We were right before the Bourne Bridge in my whole life when we went to the Cape, I couldn't wait to get to the bridge because I knew when we got to, to one of the bridges that it was fun on the other side. There were beaches, it was vacation. You know, I always couldn't wait to go over the bridge and look at the canal, but that night I didn't want to go over that bridge because I knew that there was, no, there was nothing good waiting for me on the other side. We got to the hospital and um, my husband and I stood there while my only child was given the last rites. Um, I asked if they could med flight him to Boston. They told me that he was too weak and he would not survive a med flight, but they were on the phone with Mass General and Brigham and Women's and they were doing everything that um, they could for him. I 
was, I, I couldn't even wrap my head around anything that was happening, and I was kind of roaming in the hospital, and I looked up and there was a hospital chapel. So I turned the doors about three o'clock in the morning and it was open. So I went in there and I just prayed. I prayed to God, please don't take my only child. And at that moment, although I didn't even know it, Corey's cause was formed because I knew whether he lived or he died, that I wanted to take what was happening and turn it around and try to make something positive and be some kind of advocate for addiction because I never wanted another mother to feel the way that I felt at that moment. Um, by the grace of God or whatever higher power that you may believe in, Corey survived that night and every night after. Um, it's been a long road for us. He suffered an anoxic brain injury. Um, and the worst day of my life became the best day of my life because he made it. Now, how in the world do we ever get to the, that point? Corey was a very gifted student and athlete. He went to Taunton High School, where we live. I think he, we have some Taunton High in the house today, do right? Do we have Taunton High in the house here? Go Tigers. There you go, go hey. Tigers. Um, you'll see in the video that we're gonna play, he played soccer, he played football, he was the quarterback, he was the kicker, he played baseball, a very gifted baseball player. Uh, he was a good pitcher. He was actually being scouted by a Major League Baseball team uh, in his junior year. And you know, he was on top of the world, he was up here. Uh, what happened? Uh, in that spring of his junior year, he was pitching a game and his arm didn't really feel right. And he knew that something was wrong. We took him to the doctor and after some x-rays and tests, found out he had a torn labrum in his right shoulder. And that was gonna require surgery. He had that surgery in the summer between his junior and senior year. And when he had the surgery afterwards, he was given Percocet, he was given Oxy for the pain after the surgery. And he took those pills as prescribed by the doctor. Unfortunately, the surgery turned out to be not successful and Corey would never throw another baseball or a football competitively ever again. So as you can imagine, that dashed a lot of his hopes, dreams, aspirations of what could be in the future. And uh, he finished high school. You'll see him walk across the stage in the video and get his diploma from Taunton High, and he went to UMass Dartmouth. He was accepted into the nursing program there. And when he was there, you know, he went to all, he was living there on campus, and what were all of his friends doing after uh, classes? Well, they were going to soccer practice, or they were going to football practice, or they were going to baseball practice. And unfortunately, Corey wasn't going to any of those things because he could not play any more sports like that due to the injury on his shoulder that did not heal properly. So he had some spare time on his hands and he started doing some thinking. And he started thinking, you know, when I took those pills, they not only made the physical pain go away, they kind of made me feel a little bit better inside too. And you know, life is about making choices and decisions. The average person makes over 200 choices and decisions a day. What am I gonna to wear today to work? What am I gonna have for lunch today? The majority of those choices and decisions don't matter. But some of them, of course, do. And if you make the wrong choice or decision, it can have dire consequences. So he started doing some thinking, and he started making some poor choices, and he started realizing, you know, I'm gonna go out and seek those pills on campus. And he started buying those pills in one pill a day, became five a day, became 10 a day, and he became addicted to them. And uh, he couldn't keep up his studies and he ended up um, dropping out of school, coming back home to live with us. We sent him away to um, rehab to get well. And honestly, mom and I, we kind of thought we were gonna be one and done. We'd send him away to rehab once, he would get well, he would stay well, and whew, dodge that bullet. That just goes to show you, we knew nothing, absolutely nothing about addiction at that point. We just figured, oh, okay, he's going to treatment, he's gonna come home, life's gonna be good again. That's not what happens. Because addiction is not a choice, it's a disease. And it's also a disease of relapse. You know, you're gonna to wanna to be well, you're gonna to wanna to get well and stay well. But unfortunately, sometimes you're going to relapse. And over the course of the next five and a half years, Corey relapsed a total of 12 times. It was now the summer of 2013. and. We had sent him away to a long-term facility down the Cape in Falmouth, and he was there. He was there for about two months, and it went through the program, and after the program, Mom and I decided that um, you know, he was now a man in his mid-20s. Um, maybe you should not come home back to Taunton and live with us. Maybe you should live in a sober house for a while. So he was living there in a sober house for about another additional month and a half, and it was now July 15, 2013, when my wife got that terrible phone call about what had happened and how he relapsed time number 13, which almost cost him his life, but thankfully did not. So we're gonna show you this video right now. It tells you a little bit more about the story and the journey that we went through, and then you'll have the opportunity to meet him afterwards.
When you're addicted, you hurt the people that you love the most. People don't realize that an addict is the kid next door. It doesn't stop, it just keeps mushrooming, getting, getting worse and worse, until it just spirals completely out of control. My life sucks now. So it was July 15th, 2013, and my cell phone rang. My name is Tom. I live with Corey in the sober house. And he said, uh, you know, I'm sorry to tell you that he relapsed. And the neurologist came in there neurologist and just came in, yeah. pretty much kind of said, well, we think now he might live, but he has extensive brain damage. And uh, maybe his brain is only functioning at 20%. And then they had um, to take him off the life support. And they weren't sure whether his brain was functioning enough that he would breathe on his own. So that was kind of scary within itself, not knowing whether once they turned that machine off, whether he would breathe on his own. I remember when I woke up at the hospital and I had a tube down my throat and it hurt and I couldn't see anything except the white sheet. He was always very athletic from day one. He loved baseballs and footballs and basketballs. He played in East Little League. He made Little League when he was nine, and he played four years in Little League, and he made the All-Stars all four years of Little League. He was a really good pitcher and shortstop, really good baseball player, very talented. He was the type of kid that any sport he played, he excelled at. He played on the freshman team at Taunton High, and then when he was a sophomore, he tried out for varsity, and he made the varsity team. He also played freshman football, and as a freshman, he also played varsity. He was the kicker on the varsity team. He was a quarterback on the freshman and JV team and a kicker on the varsity team. Um, Corey was an excellent student all through school. He was always on the honor roll from first grade through his senior year in high school. His sophomore year at Taunton High, he was inducted into the National Honor Society which was a proud moment for me as a mom. He was always a really good student. He was always a really good kid, never had any behavior issues with him, never had a detention, never had any problems at all with him. He was always really good, never gave me a hard time. His junior year going into senior year, he hurt his shoulder and he had to have shoulder surgery on his right arm, which um, was devastating to him because it dashed all his dreams of moving forward and playing baseball in college or professionally. And that is kind of where, that's the underlying reason for where the addiction started. I had to get surgery um, going into my senior year of high school. And then when I had the surgery, I realized that I like the feeling of being on Percocets. So from there, it snowballed. He went to UMass Dartmouth as a nursing major. And um, unfortunately, he couldn't play any sport in college due to his shoulder injury. And that's where, on campus, he got a little anxious and depressed and upset of what had happened to him um, with his scholarships. Um, my dreams were to play baseball in college. And when that didn't happen, I felt depressed and anxious all the time. And I remembered that when I took the Percocets, how good they made me feel. 
So then I started to take Percocets every day in order to feel better. He was going through a lot of emotional things, some depression, some anxiety. And my husband and I weren't really aware of that, only because he wasn't living at home. I went from pills to heroin one day when I went to a friend's house, and he had heroin. And I tried it, and it was the best feeling I've ever felt. We, we knew that he had had a problem with prescription pills, um, with Percocet and Oxy, and we were trying to deal with that, but nothing prepared us for the moment that we found out he was using heroin. It was Christmas Eve, 2009. Dave pushed the door open, and he was in there with a needle. Doing heroin was me chasing that original high the whole time. Some people call it chasing the magic dragon. If he was using every day and he was out at, you know, his grandfather's house or out socially or working a job, nobody would ever know. Um, because it comes a point with heroin where they don't use to get high, they use to get by. Because if they don't use, they're going to get sick. To buy the drugs, I would pawn stuff from the house. I even pawned all my mother's jewelry and my grandfather's wedding ring. I used heroin to maintain my daily life. We tried to reason with him. We tried so many different addiction centers. We just tried everything and nothing worked. And then it just gets to a point where you have to realize this is way bigger than we are and we just needed some professional help. There's so many resources out there for parents, um, and, but we weren't aware of any of them. And, you know, Dave and I would sit in, in our kitchen, like, where do we turn? What do we do? I'd never dealt with addiction before in my life. I was ashamed or embarrassed to ask anybody about it. Mm -hmm. And I, don't know, I just felt like it's not out there enough. There's not resources, there's a ton of them, but how do you find out where they are and what's available to you? You know, a lot of them, when you send them to a short-term thing, like seven days, 10 days, whatever it is, they're not going to get it in seven or 10 days. And, and I, I think insurance companies kind of need to be, to maybe rethink that about how they deal with this issue. He has balance issues. Um, he does have a lot of falls. If he moves too quickly or he bends over, he will fall. So he can still walk around and maneuver around and do okay, but he can't see small print, he can't read, he can't use the computer, he can't use the cell phone. I have to help him in the morning um, when he gets stressed. He can't button or zip. I have to help him tie his shoes. He has problems um, holding utensils, brushing his, um, teeth. brushing his teeth, those kind of normal everyday tasks. He can't, you know, cut cut his food or eat. we even have special utensils that we bought. Yeah, he's getting better handles. with those. He's, he's getting, getting better, better with, with those. It. But it is a difficult time for him just to feed himself. You know, there are resources out there that you can use, and uh, it's, addiction is something that shouldn't be kept in the closet hidden. You know, it, the more you talk about it and you get it, and get it out there, the better, it, the better it is in the end. Every day I want to help somebody else who might be going through the same things that I am. As bad as it was, I'm lucky because I didn't hear the words, we're sorry, you know, he's gone. He, he lived. Talk to your family or your friends about it so that you can get the proper help. Don't think that this could never happen to you because it can happen to you. And if it does happen to you, don't be ashamed or embarrassed and just hold your head up high and just get the help that you need for not only your child or whoever the addict is in your family, but for yourself, 
and there is help out there and to please go and try to get it and don't be ashamed or embarrassed. You might think that doing drugs are going to make you cool and all your friends might be asking you to do that and everything and maybe you even try it once or twice and you nothing happens and you might get away with it once, twice, a hundred times. But in the end, you know, something bad could certainly come of that. You know, you should stay away from them to begin with and, you know, they can ruin your life. Don't do any drugs because you can end up like me. Very powerful video. If we could just pause it, okay. Um, you know, Corey was on life support for nine days. And uh, even after that, when he came out of the coma and everything, he spent the next I want to say month and a half, almost two months, having to have a feeding tube that went directly into his stomach uh, to give him the nourishment that he needed because, you know, when he overdosed, he suffered some brain, brain damage. And most, most people think the brain is just in charge of intelligence and things like that. Your brain controls everything about your body, even simple things such as swallowing. He had to learn how to swallow all over again, and that took a couple of months, and that's why the feeding tube was used. But he's here today and he wants to share his story in, in, in the hopes that what happened to him won't happen to anybody in this room. Are you guys ready to meet him? Yeah. All right, Corey, come on out. Hi everybody, how's everybody doing today? I'm awesome. Um, first off, I would like to say, give a shout out to all these Taunton Tigers in the building. <laughs> and especially to Tim Smith. <laughs> because like actually my eighth grade of of a middle school. He was actually the coach of my stepfather, Dave. And um, he actually gave me the confidence that I needed to start because um, like, I thought that like, I was only starting because like, my stepfather was the coach. No. Except that actually Tim Smith actually pulled me aside and said, no, you're starting because you're better than the other kids. So thank you for actually giving me the confidence. And that was basketball, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was the uh, middle school basketball team. Corey never had played basketball until he got into middle school, and he was a little nervous about it. So he always felt like you gave him that confidence he needed, he needed so thank you. Um, first off, I would like to apologize because the video is a little bit outdated. Because at the end of the video, Dave actually says something to the effect that I have a problem feeding myself. Except that I bet that all of you can tell by looking at me that I no longer <laughs> have that problem. Food kind of became his um, new addiction after his overdose. Um, Corey was always tall and thin but 180 pounds, 6'2", and he um, ballooned to up over 300 pounds. Um, he's back to about 250 now, so I want to congratulate him because he is working his way back. Mm -hmm. Good job. And then another thing that is wrong in the video is that at the very beginning I said that my life sucks now, except that I no longer feel that way because like when I first woke up from the coma in the hospital, um, I kept saying to my mother, why am I alive, why am I alive? Because like I felt like I was going to be nothing but a burden to her for the rest of my life. And like I had no idea like how I was going to be able to live my life with like all these new disabilities. And then it wasn't until like the first speaking engagement that we ever did to a group of people just like you 
that I said to her afterwards, I said, Mom, this is violent, this is violent, because like I feel like this is giving me a reason and a purpose to get up out of bed every day. So thank you very much. And which then leads me into like the next thing that I wish that I could retract from the video, which is heroin is not the best feeling I've ever felt because nothing can compare to speaking to a group of young people and hopefully saving at least one life in this room. Um, I remember like when I was in high school, middle school and college, going to assemblies just like this and thinking to myself, why do I need to be here because this is never going to happen to me, except it did happen to me. So if it can happen to me, it can happen to any one of you. So please keep that in mind if like the opportunity to use any kind of drug ever comes up. Who in here likes to use a cell phone? Who in here likes to drive or the idea of driving? All just the young people's hands go up, you know? Yeah. That? <laughs> that is why I said the idea of driving. Um, and then who in here likes to use social media? Stop. <laughs> he does. Um, because those are just like a few things that I can no longer do anymore due to my newfound disabilities. It's really important to Corey that he stresses that um, the things that young people like to do, that he loved to do, uh, he can no longer do. He's now legally blind. He can see the big picture but he can't see really small print. And probably the best way for me to describe how he sees things is if you took your hand and went like this over your face, he can only see what's in between. So if there's a word and it's big enough, he might be able to figure out what it says. But the word could say D-I-G, dig, and he might not see the middle letter and think it's dog. So sometimes it's a, it's a guessing game for him. But you know, him being able to get in the car and go hang out with his friends or go watch the Patriots with his buddies, you know, he can't do any of that anymore. He, you know, has completely lost all his freedom. If he wants to go somewhere, either me or Dave have to take him. He just loves that. But, What's wrong with that? I know, right? But uh, his friends come over and they pick him up and they take him to dinner uh, at least once a month, which is really nice. But uh, so many of the things that we do and on a daily basis. And they'll even pay sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but some of the things that you do on a daily basis that so you don't really think about, they're not part of his life anymore, and it's really, it's really hard for him. Um, I asked him, I said, what do you miss most um, that you could do before? And he said, definitely driving, definitely being able to get in the car and go where I want to go and do what I want to do. And then the choices I made were the wrong ones, except that nobody's perfect. So as long as you learn from the first mistake and don't keep making it over and over again, then I think that you'll be OK. Um, which leads me into like the next thing, which is don't let your mistakes define you, let what you do after your mistakes define you, which is basically the way that I now live my life. I'm really proud of him because he took, um, he was in a bad place and he took something negative and he turned it around and he's made it a positive. Um, through everything that he's been through, through his struggles with addiction and his overdose and his brain injury. He's, he looked at the big picture and said, I can do two things. I can sit home and just moan and groan about this, or I can try to make a difference and try to help other people by sharing my story and, and um, help hopefully prevent one person from, from going down the road that, um, that he went. So I'm really proud of him that he's taken those steps to, to do this with his life. And then if there are a few things that I would like all of you to leave here with today, it is to be a leader, not a follower, which is pretty self-explanatory. Then be unique, it's okay to be your own person. 
Don't do it just because somebody else is, and don't be afraid to say no. And then the most important thing that I always like to stress to everybody is to not to let one thing define you. Because growing up, I always just defined myself as an athlete. And then once I lost that, I had no idea who I was anymore or who to relate to. So just know that all of you are special and unique in a multitude of different ways. Um, drugs can lead to being arrested, put in jail, and even death, except they can also leave you disabled for the rest of your life, just like me. So please keep that in mind, too, if like, the opportunity to use drugs ever comes up. There was a quote that Corey saw that he really touched him and he wanted me to read. It's from Malcolm X and it says, the future belongs to those who prepare for it today. And basically what he's saying is, you know, you can do or be anything you want to be in your future as long as you make good, smart, healthy choices for yourself today. And then if you do, moving forward, you know, the future is yours and um, you can do anything or be anything you want to be. As one we are strong, Together we are stronger, but as a team we are the strongest. Now let's kick this opiate epidemic out of this community, this state, and this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Okay. I, want to, um, I want to go back to when Corey was at Taunton High School. As Dave had said earlier, his junior year at Taunton High School, he had a pro scout from the Major League Baseball team, the Seattle Mariners, come to Taunton, and he was being scouted by them. So the thought of possibly being drafted um, into the Major Leagues was a pretty exciting thing for him. Uh, you know, we all knew that the Major Leagues was a long ways away from that point, but every Major League Baseball player's journey starts on their high school um, field or their college baseball field or in their hometown. So. It was a really exciting time for Corey. He was on the top of the world. He was 17 years old. He had some scholarship offers to play baseball at college. So having a free ride to college was great, not only for him, but for us. It would have made his dream come true to be able to play baseball in college. It would have also helped um, Dave and I financially. Um, when he lost, uh, when he hurt his arm, Everybody dropped him like a hot potato. The pro scout went away, the college scholarship offers went away, and he really didn't know how to handle it. And he went from being up here in his world, crashing down to here. And like Dave said earlier, he was feeling really depressed and anxious about that. And he remembered that when he took the opiates that it made him feel better inside. And that's when he started seeking out the drugs. And what I want to tell you is that no drug or no drink of alcohol is going to solve your problem. They will become the biggest problem you will ever have. So please don't use them as a crutch. Don't use them as something to make yourself feel better. Don't try to self-medicate yourself because I think Corey will tell you that he thought, I can, I can control this. Um, after a while, the drug controls you. You do not control the drug. So it's really important that if you have, um, did I say that right? Yeah. I think I did, yeah. Um, it's really important that if, you, if you're feeling depressed or anxious, go and see someone. Talk to someone. Talk about your problems. See someone professionally or talk to a friend or a trustworthy adult, someone in your life. And if you need to get prescribed the proper medications, you can certainly do that, but don't, don't try to take care of things yourself. Um, sometimes things are way bigger than we are, and um, alcohol and drugs are not going to take care of those. You know, a lot of people, because of the stigma of the disease or they don't understand addiction, a lot of times when we talk at schools, we've actually spoken at over 180 different schools and community events, the biggest feedback that we get from kids is they say, oh, I didn't know you could become addicted from a prescription. So. That's great for us that we got that across to them, but um, it's not all about partying and getting high and having a good time. People can become <coughs> addicted to a prescription like Corey did, and I want to tell you a story about a mother that I met. I was actually asked to go to Chicago with a group of um, 14 other parent advocates that advocate for addiction, and um, we all had kids that struggled with addiction or had lost a child. 
but our stories were all so different. And um, this woman, she lived in Atlanta. Her son was a senior in high school. It was about this time of the year. It was, um, you know, getting towards the spring. And he was really starting to get nervous about graduation and prom and college and everything, all these changes that were coming up in his life. He was his class president, and he ended up graduating that year as his class valedictorian. So he was number one in his class. He was really a smart, smart kid. And he was having a problem sleeping, you know, um, worrying about this and that, and he, he couldn't sleep at night. His dad had had surgery and got a prescription of Vicodin and put the bottle of pills in the medicine cabinet. Wanted to save him for a rainy day, might get a backache or a toothache. His dad um, did not take the pills. His parents weren't aware of it, but he went in there. The first night he went in there and he couldn't sleep and he opened up the medicine cabinet and he thought, hmm, I wonder if this will help me sleep. So he took one, he took a Vicodin and he slept like a baby. It was great, great night's sleep, best night's sleep he had had in weeks. So he continued to take a Vicodin every day <coughs> to help him sleep until they were gone. He became addicted to them. He went off to college. Six months later, the Atlanta, Georgia police were at his parents' door. They had found him dead in his car. He had died of a heroin overdose. Now, here's a kid who was innocently taking pills out of a medicine cabinet because they were helping him sleep. So please don't ever take, don't assume that you can just take something. Please don't ever take a pill out of a medicine cabinet. Please don't ever take anything that's not prescribed to you. And if you do have medications in your house, I think Sheila touched on that earlier, If you lock them up. If you want to keep them, lock them up so they're out of the hands of not even just people in your household. It could be a friend or something that comes over. Or every police department has a dispensary where you can bring these pills and um, dispose of them. And they don't even have to be pain medication. It can be any kind of medication that you have in your house that, that is not being used. But it's so important that we never take anything out of a cabinet or something that's not um, prescribed to us. And you know, Corey's um, was introduced to this prescription by a doctor. And I think it's important that when this happened 10 years ago, um, addiction never even crossed my mind. Nobody was talking about um, addiction it was kind of at the beginning of the whole opioid crisis, and they were kind of prescribing this stuff like candy and said that it wasn't addicting. And so, you know, I didn't ask those important questions. So please have the conversation with your doctor. Ask those important questions. What is this, this that you're prescribing me? Can you prescribe me something else? Is there any alternate pain management? Can I take some Motrin and Tylenol and use a little bit of ice or whatever it may be? Um, obviously, Corey can't ever have another opiate again, and he had four wisdom teeth pulled out a couple months ago. And it was a little rough for him, but he had some Tylenol and some Motrin and and a bunch of fribbles from Friendly, so he, he did all right. But, a um, lot of fribbles. Yeah. You know, the, the biggest <coughs> killer of our youth today is sitting in our medicine cabinets in our home, so it's really important to remove that. Um, I don't know if and most of you know that the number one killer of teenagers in this country was auto accidents. It's now drug overdoses. It's overpassed auto accidents, surpassed it. So well, it's really important that at a young age that you learn as much as you can about addiction moving forward. So hopefully, you know, what happened to Corey won't happen to any of you or that you could, you know, lose your life. And for the adults in the room, I always like to share my thought on the three most dangerous words you can think are not my kid. Um, Corey was raised, you know, in a good home. He had a lot of family support. He had a lot of love. He had, um, he was a nursing major in college. He knew the dangers of drugs. He went through the DARE program at school. We talked to him about drugs, and he told me, Mom, I'll never use drugs. I'm an athlete. Um, but it happened. He told me that after he had his surgery, the first day when I filled that prescription and I gave him a Percocet, he said he lit up like a Christmas tree. It was an instant addiction for him. And I said to him, you know, Corey, why didn't you tell me? And he said, Mom, I was 17 years old. I liked the way I felt. I didn't think that I was going to become addicted to these pills. So um, they are highly addictive. So you know, please just keep that in mind. You know, people who use drugs are not bad people. Um, you know, it is a disease, and it truly is a family disease too. It affects everyone in the family. But you know, if you're feeling any certain way, or you feel like you might be struggling a little bit, please reach out for help. Please talk to someone. Uh, there's a tables full of resources out there, so there's so many people 
back, back in the back of the room that can help you if you need anything. You can also, this is our website, it's coreyscause.com. You can um, con hit the contact button up, the contact us button and reach out to us and we'll get you, we'll send you, you know, where you need to go. We're not experts on addiction, but we have lived it and we'll try to help you. Um, or there's a resource button. For those of you that are in high school and those of you that are in college, we have a Corey's Cause Scholarship. The tab is there at the top. You can clip, clip on, cl click on that tab and complete the scholarship application right online. The only requirement that we have is that you write an essay, can be one paragraph, can be five pages, whatever you're comfortable with about your feelings on the opioid epidemic. Last year we gave, we awarded $17,500 in scholarships. Over the last three years we've awarded over $40,000 in scholarships to um, local high school and college kids. If you are a college student, you are also eligible to apply for it. So it's not just for um, high school, it is for college. Yeah, the biggest requirement, like Corey said he wanted me to stress, was the essay. We don't care if you're number one in your class or number 200 in your class. What we care about is that um, your what your thoughts are. personal thoughts on the, S, on the opiate epidemic, think not like a bunch of statistics and figures. Sometimes we get essays and you can tell somebody Googled everything and they looked it up. They'll tell us this, this was how many deaths there were. Um, that's really not what we're looking for. Usually the, the committee awards scholarships to those people that really put down their heart and their soul on that piece of paper. You know, sometimes we've gotten letters that, oh, my mother struggled, or my brother struggled, or I lost a cousin or a neighbor. And those are the kind of things that we want to hear. We want to hear how, you know, addiction has impacted your life, or even if it hasn't impacted your life, um, your thoughts on it more so than just throwing some statistics at us. I mean, statistics are great, but, um, you know, we're looking more for that heartfelt, like, um, statement or essay from you. I couldn't think of the word essay. So, um, like I said before, addiction knows no boundaries. It doesn't discriminate. And it can happen to anyone. And, you know, don't let it happen to you. And I want to thank you all for allowing us to share Corey's story. Thank you, guys. Does anyone have any questions for us? No questions? Shall we give away? I have questions. I'd like you to use the microphone so everybody can hear. So I'm just going to grab this so we can pass it around. Questions? Questions? Comments, complaints, go to Dave. <laughs> Can I, can I ask a question, I guess, for the younger people um, that are in here? From the minute, the moment that you walked in to when you're leaving, do you feel like you know a little bit more about addiction or that you were impacted by Corey's story? That's awesome. I see a lot of head shaking, so thank you. That's why you know, we do what we do. You know, exactly. Because a lot of people, like I said, think it's only, they don't realize you can get addicted from a prescription or how that boy Davis was taking pills to help him sleep, how um, you can become addicted in many different ways. Um, I just want to thank Corey for coming out and actually speaking and having the strength to speak and tell us your story and talking to us about it. I think you're really strong for that and very courageous for that. So. Thank you, except like actually I'd like to thank all of you because doing this is actually like giving me like my life back mm -hmm. and has actually like made us feel as like a family, so thank you very much. Well, you're doing a very good job and thank you're doing you. very good things, all thank, of you. Thank you, because sometimes it's not always easy to get up in front of a group of people and share all your dirty laundry, I guess, um, for <laughs> lack of a better term, um, of what we went through, but it makes us feel like it didn't happen in vain, mm -hmm. that by doing this, um, you know, we're trying to make something good out of something and bad that happened. And the most ironic thing about this whole thing is that I was actually a nursing major in college, and like I think that now I'm actually probably saving more lives than I ever could as like a nurse. Mm -hmm. And every time we talk at a high school, we always tell the kids just one, just one, just if we can impact one life in this room, then we know we've made a difference. And we've actually, you know, we always tell the kids at the schools reach out to a trustworthy adult in their lives or a trustworthy adult in their, the school building. 
go to guidance or go to a teacher or whoever, um, you know, to, to get help. And we've actually had two separate incidents where a principal has emailed us and told me that um, kids, after we spoke, went to guidance and asked for help, said they were struggling. So um, t I started crying like a baby when I saw that because I thought that's, that's why we do what we do. And, you know, we go and we speak at these schools and we leave, but we don't know you know, if it's impacted anyone. And to get some feedback like that, it was really nice to know that we made, you know, a difference. I look at it like I, th I believe that God works through people. And let's face it, back on July 15, 2013, Corey's life was there for the taking. You know, no one expected him to live. God let him live. And uh, to maybe carry out his work going forward in helping others. We really feel like this was supposed to happen only because last summer, Corey was at Brigham and Women's and the neurologist was looking at his brain scan from, or his MRI and he said to Corey, I don't know how you're as smart as you are. Like there's so much damage here. He, I mean, his walking, his motor, fine motor is, is he has a difficult time with. Um, speech has been an issue, but it's getting so much better. Balance, but he's as smart as he was when he was in college. It has not affected him cognitively. And I still have like a better memory than these two combined. He does, no, he, doesn't. he does. No, he doesn't. He does, he'll be in his room and I'll be like, Corey, what was the name of that movie? You know, that Robin Williams was in or whatever. And he's like, who's got brain damage around here? You guys can't remember anything. I'm like, I know it's true, but um, his, his, and he's like a miracle. When he left Falmouth Hospital and they moved him to Mass General in Boston, the whole staff at Falmouth Hospital was like, we don't know how he's leaving here today, alive and well. They just had no expectations of him living. And then they thought that um, when they took him off the life support, he was going to be unresponsive and he wasn't going to breathe on his own. Um, or he would be like, you know, just never wake up and everything that they thought would happen, the reverse has happened. So we're thankful, we're thankful for that because there's so many people that are losing their loved ones and I don't know why my son's life was spared but we want to make sure that we're thankful for that and we give back. Any other questions or comments? Hi guys, how you doing? Hi. I just wanted to add that uh, you know you may get after an assembly such as this or in a larger crowd, whatever. You may have that obvious like, oh, I, we made connections with that kid. You may have that obvious like, wow, that was a home run. But you know, as somebody who's you know struggled with a, a substance abuse problem myself and realized that up to that moment of truth, where you have to admit that you can't do it alone. There's all these signposts that pop up, and you push them right back down like whack-a-mole, kind of, and you 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 uh, you diminish them and you discard them and you discount them, but but there's a seed planted, you know, there's a seed planted, and these things start to pile up, and then sooner or later, you know, like you've had enough. So when you speak to these schools, Corey, I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. You are reaching a lot more people than, than you have evidence of, you know. Those, that fruit's going to bloom. You know, that fruit's going to continue to bloom. So you know you're doing a good job, but you're doing an even better job than you think you're doing. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. you no, know, I always like tell the kids, too, that, you know, you might hear this now, but I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe when you're in you're in high school right now and you're not using any drugs, but you might be at a party in college and somebody's got some pills and that in there, the, Corey will pop up in their head. Oh God, I remember Corey, you know, I remember that, that assembly. So that's what we hope for, like you said, is planting the seeds, giving people more tools for their tool belt and carrying that with them and maybe at some point using, using it, so. Yes, back there. <laughs> um, as a parent, I have three teenage boys. They're all athletes, and what I've really taken out of, out of this today, thank you for coming, um, is the vacuum that not having sports in Corey's life creates. Yeah, it did. Yes. That's something I never considered. My son just wore his MCL wrestling, and yeah. I never considered the emotional effect of how he would fill that void with something that wasn't athletic. Yes. That really resonated with me, especially in this, in this day and age of you know, club sports and kids playing year-round mm -hmm. and 
it really creates a vacuum. I, I hadn't even considered it. It does. Um, when he was growing up, I was, oh, let's keep him busy. And he wanted to play every sport, so I let him play every sport because I figured I'm keeping him out of trouble, right? Except for and football until my Except first. I told him he couldn't play football until he was a freshman because I was afraid he was going to get hurt. So it's like all of a sudden he became a freshman in high school. He's like, I'm playing football. But um, he truly did not know how to live his life without athletics. Um, it was such a big part of his life, and he defined himself as an athlete. He missed the camaraderie with the guys, the whole team aspect, just going to practice every day, um, everything that comes with that. And, you know, I kind of felt bad because I thought, you know, I did this and kept him busy and kept him in every sport to keep him out of trouble. And it's the, it's the one thing that caused him to have issues. So, um, yeah, it's really important that as parents that we learn that we need to, to to teach our kids that you might be an athlete or an artist or a dancer or a musician, but there's so many other parts to you. Don't, don't focus on that one part. Don't put all your eggs in one basket because that's what happened to him. He was an emotional mess. Um, just did, did not do well with it because um, that's all he thought he was. He didn't realize there were so many other parts to him. I see that play out. I've coached all sports at all ages. And you see that play out so many times. Yeah. You do. My wife and I talk, my kids are in high school now, and, hey, what do we do with our time when they don't have sports anymore? That, yeah. Every once that we ask each other, what are they going to do with their time when yeah. I mean, they don't have sports anymore? Because the majority of kids are not going to make it to Major League Baseball or the NFL or, you know, I'm whatever. Sure JV, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And play sports to fill time, like you just said. And yeah. It, it really is sparked an interest. So you said that the people you went back for, I'm one person here today, you went back to five people tonight, I'm going to go home. I'm going to watch a video of my three kids and my wife, and I'm going to talk to them and discuss it. So good. Thank and you. it's good because, you know, we, um, it is right there on our website, so you can watch it. We had, I actually got an email one time from a dad, and it was pretty funny, because he said, my, my son saw your presentation at school today. He's a senior in high school, and he said, for four years, every night we sit down for dinner, and I say, so what happened at school today? Nothing. He said, I got the usual answer, nothing. Anything going on? Nope. So he said, last night, I asked the same question I've asked for four years, and I got an answer. Hey, yeah, this kid, Corey, came to my school. And he said, and he told me about it, and he said, and we went on your website, and we watched it, and he said to me, thank you for opening up that conversation for me. And he said, you know, they sat there at the dinner table, and they talked about it, and Corey's story, and uh, to me, that was really important, too, that um, we reach not only kids but adults. We actually spoke to a group of police officers down in Yarmouth because we do a lot of nurses and police officers trying to bring a personal side to the story. And it was kind of the same thing. He was in the back of the room and he raised his hand and he said, ugh, I have like two boys and one daughter and he goes, I have a really sick feeling in my stomach right now because your kid could be my kid. And I said to him, that's good. I want you to leave here with that feeling. I want you to leave here realizing, oh my gosh, this could happen. So um, I'm glad that, you know, that that impacted you and you can go home and, and have that conversation. But yeah, we, we need to try to, um, you know, like he was such a gifted athlete and, and that was like his whole world. And, you know, he's, and it was all taken from him. And, you know, you can only imagine at 17 years old to have a major league baseball scout looking at you and then to have that gone, how devastating it was for him. But he just didn't, he did not know how to live his life without sports. And like I tell him now, all right, you didn't have a team sport, but you could have went to the Y and shot hoops. You could have went to the <coughs> gym. There's other things that he could have done, but he wanted that team, that camaraderie, that the togetherness of, of the team, and that was gone. Thank you. Anybody else? Other questions? No other questions? We just have a couple, um, if everybody's all set, we just have a couple of little trivia questions. See so who's paying attention during our video and our presentation, and um, you can come up and get a Corey's Cause t shirt. All right, we'll start with something easy here now. So, what was the Major League Baseball team that was scouting him? Go ahead, Patty. Oh, it yeah, was the Seattle, Seattle Mariners. Mariners yeah. All right, you can come up and get a t shirt at the, at the end, too. How about another one? What was the exact date, month, day, and year of his almost fatal overdose? Right here. July 15, 2013 is right. You've got a t-shirt. 
And why don't you do one about that special person? Yeah, I'm going to do a um, thing. It's called Who Am I? See if you can guess who this is. And the reason that I'm doing this is this person um, had a lot of struggles in their life, and they completely turned their life around. And um, see if you can figure out who it is. It's someone famous, and they're from Massachusetts. Okay, they developed a cocaine addiction at the age of 13. They dropped out of school to steal and use drugs. They went to prison at age 16 for felonious assault. This next one, somebody might get it. Initially became famous as a model and musician, but that was short-lived. He reinvented himself as an actor. I just gave you a clue, he. Mark Wahlberg, Mark that's right. Wahlberg. There yep. you go. His name is Mark Wahlberg. Legends never quit. Don't let your past or mistakes you make in your life define you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. So whoever got a t-shirt can come up at the end and grab one. Yep. Sure. Yep. Um, Corey, have you ever done like special needs like sports programs? Like those are a thing that my brother's done at school. Like Special Olympics and things like that? There's, um, there's some at Spalding, Boston, um, where he went. He was actually at Spalding, Boston for a while, probably a month. And he was in the hospital for like 40 days, but um, they do different events. Um, I actually yeah. can do it and like rode a bike, like a sit down bike, like one that actually had two people in it. But did it have like extra wheels and stuff? But they, yeah, they do have programs, but a lot of it is, a lot of those programs I have to take them into the city, so, um, which is time consuming um, for we, me. We both still but, work. You know, yeah. He's very, um, I'm gonna think of a nice word to say this, but I can't. He's very awkward and clumsy now. He used to be like very graceful and smooth. Um, he has a hard time, he falls a lot. So safety is always an issue with him. Um, that's why we keep him in the wheelchair, um, because he falls a lot. So just worried about him falling. Uh, well, there's like programs where you can be in a wheelchair and go shoot basketball. Yep. Mm, yeah, they, it's amazing at Spalding, Boston, what they have. Uh, they have so many programs for, uh, for people. Any other questions or thoughts? If it's okay, because we have such a captive audience, I just wanted to um, just review a couple other things. Not review, say a few more things. Um, so, I wanna say first of all, that presentations like this humble us all. You know, a lot of us, some of us are in human services here in the room, some are peer leaders. Um, but, we had a gentleman in the back, for example, who does a lot of this type of work and spoke about his, you know, he learned something today. I think we all learn things when we listen to presentations like this. So I wanna just thank you again. And I also wanna say that, um, you know, that, that help, you know, that was, that was discussed if anyone, you know, if this brings up any negative or uncomfortable feelings for anyone, whether it's a uh, concern about a friend, your own use, someone else's, please get, get help, talk to someone. Um, and also, as a younger person, I think it, it's super, super important to remember to have people in mind, not just your parents or your grandparents, have people in mind before you potentially get into a risky situation. Because we're all human, we all make mistakes, you know, so you may be at a party, you may end up having, you know, some drinks, you may end up doing something else. I don't know, but if you do, you want to have people in mind that you can call on to, whether it's you know an older relative or you know a friend of a parent, whatever. Just make sure you have those kinds of things in mind. You know, uh, sometimes in the field we, we think of those things as harm reduction. So think about you know if you were to get into a, a risky or negative situation, how you might be able to get out of it. Um, you know, don't assume you know what's in the marijuana or other drugs you might be taking. And um, that's another thing we can't emphasize enough, you know, that um, there is fentanyl and other things being put in, uh, you know, fake Xanax and marijuana, so um, it's, it's very, very risky now. Um, also, the other, the other piece I think that's very important and actually kind of hits home with me, I'm attending a memorial, memorial service on Friday. Don't leave a young person alone, even if they say they're fine, you know, even if you think that it was just alcohol and they just need to sleep it off. 
Um, alcohol poisoning can happen pretty quickly to a young person, so um, make sure you know you don't you don't leave someone alone. And if you have any concerns, trust your gut and reach out to another adult. Um, and then be aware that other things can can happen too. You know when when you put alcohol and other things in the mix, and keep doing the things you're doing because being here, I can't thank you enough for being here, especially the young people. Um, so another round of applause for all the young people that are here. Thank you.